It's the Kyle Hyman Show on Redeemer Radio. This is Kyle Hyman, and joining us to talk about friendship and her book, Can We Be Friends, is Rebecca Freck. Thanks for being here, Rebecca. Hey, thanks for having me, Kyle. So good to have you here. In the introduction of your book, you talk about this conversation that you had with your grandma about the issue of friendship and kind of the state of friendship these days. And she said, quote, I'll tell you why y'all are so lonely these days. It's on account of three things, air conditioning, television, and women drivers. I love this, and your breakdown of it is so good. What did she mean by these three things causing uh, division within our friendships? Oh, my gosh. I love my grandmother. She's 96. (laughs) Just for people who are like your grandmother, she's 96, mean as a snake, still living on her own five acres, mowing her own grass here in Texas. No way. I mean, she's just like a wonder of the world. She yeah. says, like, she's, she told me the other day, she's like, well, you know I'm never going to die because I'm just mean as a snake and it's pickled me clean to the bone. <laughs> like, I mean, you just, yeah. I mean, like, you can't even talk about her without doing the accent. She's hilarious. Yeah. So, yeah, air conditioning, television, and women drivers. And uh-huh. what she said was, I don't know about the rest of the country, but here in Texas where it's so crazy hot. Right. In the evenings, people used to come home and it was too hot to be inside. And so you'd hang out on your porch in the cool of the evening and drink Uh your sweet tea and, you know, let the kids run and play. And all of your neighbors were on their porch too. And so after work, everybody just kind of hung out together on their front porches and you saw everybody. And then there was air conditioning invented and people could afford it. And people started going inside in the evening. And so you'd come home and you, it was cooler inside than outside, and so you'd hang out inside. But then she told me, she goes, but then it would get kind of boring, because, I mean, as much as you love your family, you can only look at them for so long. Uh-huh. <laughs> and so <laughs> after a while, you'd go back out on the porch to have somebody to talk to until the invention of television. Mm. And she said once television was invented and people could afford it, then people started staying inside because there was somebody to watch, and they didn't require anything of you. And so you could be entertained all evening and you didn't have to have Mitch and Betty over to play cards Mm -hmm. and clean your house and cook dinner because you could just watch Lucy and Desi on the TV instead. And she said, and so that's when people stopped really having dinner parties because you had television. She goes, and then, and this is my favorite one, she's like, and then the women drivers. (laughs) And... uh, (laughs) <laughs> and she said, she's like, once y'all started driving, because you know, she didn't drive until she was, oh, I don't know, in her 50s or 60s. But what she said is once women started driving and families started having second cars, we started expanding the circumference of how far we were, you know, our lives lived. Because when children were small, when my mom and, her, and my aunts were small, every activity they did had to be within walking distance. And my grandmother stayed home. Mm-hmm. And she was like, But then when women started driving, we started driving our children to things. And so instead of of things that they could walk to, suddenly they were taking ballet lessons 45 minutes away or piano lessons half an hour away. And she asked me as I was writing this book, she said, honey, how many hours a week do you spend in the car? Hmm. And I had to like really stop and do the math. And I said, well, I mean, in the middle of the school year when everybody has lessons and classes and whatever, I said, I probably spend probably 14 to 17 hours a week in the car. We live in Dallas. Everything is 45 minutes away. Right. That's an hour and a half round trip. And I said on a good week, 14 to, you know, 18 hours a week in the car, she goes, honey, I don't know if you noticed, but there's no people in your car. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, I mean, like the babies are there. My children are there, but my friends aren't. And she was like, if you're spending 15 hours a week in the car, how is it that you think you're going to have time to have friends? Mm-hmm. Because all your time that you would have spent with friends is on all now burned up driving people to soccer practice and ballet lessons. And I really thought about it, and I was like, oh, my gosh, she's so completely right. She always goes on and on and on. You know, that's where I get it from. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, genetics will tell. You know, but she went on and on about all of the different things. And, and the more I thought about it, the more I, I came to see really there's so much like the women drivers in the way that we have structured modern life that almost seems intentional. Like you couldn't design a better system for isolating people from each other than the way we live these days. Yeah. So what are the negative effects that come from that? Okay. So from isolation, people begin to feel, 
I mean, you start to have depression and you start to have anxiety issues and you start to have health issues. I had no idea until I began researching for this book that actually one of the best things you can do for your physical health is to have friends. It's actually shown to prevent this whole myriad of diseases better than eating right and going to the gym. And I'm a coach, and I'm still like, you need friends more than you need to go to the gym. (laughs) Because it just has this enormous emotional toll on your body to not have people. The buzzword right now is everybody needs a tribe. But um, I think it's more like we need a herd. And if you've ever watched the nerd, the, uh, the nerd channel, sorry, that's what I call it, <laughs> because I am a giant nerd, and the nature channel, sorry, uh-huh. nature channel. Okay. it's the big nerd channel, but that and the history channel. But if you've ever watched the nature channel and you watch the gazelles galloping across the savanna in Africa, and they're all with their herd because there's safety in numbers, and then all of a sudden there will be like the one that somehow, I don't know, like he lost directions, he's not that bright, I'm not sure what's wrong uh-huh. with him. <laughs> All of a sudden, he's by himself in the middle of the savannah, and you just watch this look on his face as he's in abject terror, looking around like, where did they go? Uh And the lion's going to eat me. And we all know that feeling because, oh my gosh, I'm by myself. Like, that's what we go through. You know, when we're isolated, we kind of have that moment of, this really isn't the safest, the best place for me to be. (laughs) Because human beings are a communal animal. We are herd animals. And so we have this instinctive, visceral need to find the people we belong with. We're talking with Rebecca Freck. The book is Can We Be Friends? And when you're talking about friendship and the necessity to have friends and how this can actually make us healthier, does it matter the quality of the friendship or is it just quantity? How do we determine the difference between a good friendship and a poor one? Okay, well, first of all, I would love to resurrect the word acquaintance. Nobody uses that word anymore, and people get offended. If you know, this is my acquaintance, they're like, I thought I was your friend. <laughs> but an acquaintance is just somebody you know. And then we have close acquaintances, which are people we know who we like to spend time with. Okay. And then there are the close friends, who are the people that you really can let down your barriers with, and you invest your time and energy in their life. They invest their time and energy in your life. And we really usually have a very small circle of people who are actually friends. Science shows between two and five. And those are the people you really, really need, are those super close friends that you can pour your heart out to in order to actually impact your health. But sociologically and psychologically, you need them, but then you also need uh, almost like a bullseye, like a target. Like you need your close people, and then you need your circle of close acquaintances, which are people who drag you out of your house and make sure that, you know, you see the sunlight. Uh And and you go do things with them, and then you have acquaintances, which are the people you run into at church, and you might have coffee after Mass, or you see them at the soccer field, or you see them whatever. But we need all of these different circles, and then, and this is key, all your people need to know each other because it's through Mm. them having relationships with each other and having a relationship with you that we create a social safety net that catches you when things go wrong. What about when to know when you need to let a friendship go, when it's maybe not having a positive influence on your life? When it's not having a, a positive influence? Well, I think that we all kind of start to instinctively know that, you know, when the phone rings or the text message comes and, you you know, you look at that person's name and instead of being like, yay, I love her, you go, oh, <laughs> you know, like, okay, it's time to walk away, maybe take a little break. Mm-hmm. When somebody starts to have a negative impact on your life, on your family's life, especially people who are, I call them vampires. There are people who who use a relationship in order to get help to think, you know, they always need, feel like they need help, whether it's physical help or emotional help, and they're just constantly draining. If the people around you are negative, if they are draining on you, if they are not a positive influence for your life, and good golly, if they are abusive, run away. (laughs) What role does social media play in all of this? Is that helping things or hurting things, do you think, in our friendships? I love this question because every time I say I'm writing about loneliness Uh and the first thing out of everybody's mouth is they would like nod really sagely and they would go, "Mm, social media. (laughs) And you know what I found was that 
actually social media is not the problem when it comes to the stealing of loneliness. Now, social media and too many screens do play into other psychological issues like depression. The more time that you spend on screens doing anything, but especially with social media, you begin to compare what I, and I'm not the person who coined this phrase, that somebody smarter than me did, but you begin to compare your interior life to somebody else's exterior life. So their life looks perfect, and so there must be something wrong with me. Yeah. And it causes other issues. But what they have found is that social media is actually like a Band-Aid, that we have people who are so lonely that they are calling out into the night pretty much, and hoping to hear somebody call back from them, to them, that, that they're just, they're sending like an SOS from their keyboard, please, is there somebody there, and please, can they want to talk to me, and please, can I belong? So it's actually really sad when you think about it. We have people who live next door to us that we don't know their names, hmm. but social media can be an amazing tool for meeting people. My neighborhood, we have two different groups. We have the regular homeowners group, and then we have the parent group. And I've met some amazing people on the parent group page. And so it can actually be a tool to finding your people. And in fact, social media is how I met one of my closest friends lives in Ireland. And I've never met her face to face. And I'm the godmother of her child. But we would sit up as we were nursing our babies, and it would be nighttime here and daytime there or vice versa. And we would Skype and talk to each other in the middle of the night. We'd be like, it's three in the morning here, and I just need to stay awake. And she'd be like, great, it's like eight in the morning yeah. here. So, <laughs> you know, what are you doing? For years, for like 11 years now, we have Skyped and texted, and we met on social media and have become these amazing friends. So people think it's the social media. The social media is actually a cry for help. If you're spending all your time on social media and those are the people you're talking to, you need to step outside of your house onto your front porch and see who's out there. Yeah. Maybe bake some cookies and start knocking on doors and be like that lunatic who's like, hi, I'm your neighbor. We've lived here for six years and don't know you. Yeah. And I want to, tend to and I have done this. And, and I've lived across the street from you for four years and uh-huh. I don't know who you are, so I brought you cookies. Right. Nobody says no to cookies. Nobody says no to cookies. They really don't. Yeah. <laughs> How many friends do you have? I have two incredibly, really close friends that have stuck with me. One of them I've known since the sixth grade. Uh One of them since, oh, probably my closest friend that I actually dedicated the book to the last 14 years. And then another that's almost like a best friend that we've been friends since the fourth grade. So I have my little tight circle, and then I have my circle of acquaintances and close acquaintances. I'm I'm a collector of people, so uh, yeah, I have large large circles of people because I'm an extrovert and I collect people. (laughs) Good. All right. Well, this is going to be such an important book. I know a lot of people need to read this. It's called Can We Be Friends? Rebecca Fretch, F-R-E-C-H is the author. Thank you for joining us today, Rebecca. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks for having me.